Uh, hello, and welcome to the second installment in the Congressional App Challenges Back to School webinar series. Uh, this is Download with Developers, presented by ACT, the App Association. My name is Joe Lessie, and I'm the director of the Congressional App Challenge. In the Congressional App Challenge, Congress has created the largest series of concurrent coding competitions anywhere in the world. And it's students like you that make this incredible program possible. Over 200 students from 36 states are joining us today for this webinar, uh, which is just an absolutely incredible turnout for a midday event. Last year, the Congressional App Challenge served over 10,000 students in 48 states, and we're expecting an even greater challenge this year. Eligible students can register and submit their original apps to this year's App Challenge through October 19th. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, present a special message from some of the Congressional App Challenge's biggest fans. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Susan Delbene, and I represent Washington State's first congressional district. And I'm also co-chair of the Congressional App Challenge. But before I was elected to Congress, I was a technology entrepreneur and I was an executive at Microsoft. So my career and experience has been in technology and in STEM. I am deeply committed to STEM education and STEAM education, um, the arts as well. These skills are vitally important to the next generation of American innovation, which all of you are going to be the leaders of. Um, the Congressional App Challenge is a really important way for all of our budding coders and developers and others to to try things out, to show what they can do, to think creatively and show everyone what's possible. So I'm excited to see all of the things that you're going to produce, all of your incredible technology, ideas, creativity. Um, so I wanna say good luck and welcome to the Congressional App Challenge. Hello, I'm U.S. Congressman D.K. Butterfield, representing North Carolina's first congressional district. I come to you today by way of video as I am working in my district office in Wilson, North Carolina. This is a dress down day for us as we work tirelessly to represent 750,000 people of the first district and to represent their views and interests in Washington. So today I wanna to welcome each of you to this year's Congressional App Challenge. The mission of the Congressional App Challenge is to inspire, include and innovate efforts around STEAM and coding and computer science education. I am proud to join my colleagues, my congressional colleagues, in encouraging students in all of our districts to create, innovate, and lead the vision for a better tomorrow. App creation and coding are powerful tools for this increasingly digital age, and I look forward to the creativity and brilliance that you all will bring through this challenge. The future is in your hands. And we want to do all that we can to give you the tools to succeed. I hope you enjoy the lessons that you will learn from this amazing back to school webinar. Remember, this is only the beginning. The best is yet to come. Best wishes to all of you. Hello, I'm Dina Titus, your Congresswoman from Nevada's first district. I'd like to welcome you all to the 2020 Congressional App Challenge back to school webinar. During this transition into distance and remote learning, Congress acknowledges the importance of technology in keeping us together. We're relying on innovative and creative solutions from bright minds like yours to help us through the next chapter of our nation's history. Though the Congressional App Challenge looks a little different, I'm so proud of the perseverance and enthusiasm of students participating this year. I look forward to seeing your ideas on how we can solve some of today's most pressing problems. Thank you all and thank your teachers and mentors for participating in this fun and educational exercise that just might change the world. As students and teachers alike return to school this fall, I wanna invite schools in our district to take part in something that's important to our nation's ability to continue and lead and compete globally in science and technology the Congressional App Challenge. Building and submitting an app to this competition helps students in two big ways. First, it helps students develop new skills to take creative ideas and to make them a reality. Second, it increases America's ability to compete globally in the technology world. 
Recent headlines have shown how far-reaching and dangerous countries like China, Iran, Russia, and others have become with tech scandal after tech scandal. Our country needs leaders in technology that will work and learn with integrity. We need you. While the App Challenge is a fun experience with great opportunities for recognition and prizes, it has a greater purpose to play in encouraging students to take part in our future as Americans and show the world Texas ingenuity. Hello, I'm Congress Member Judy Chu, and I encourage you to participate in the annual Congressional App Challenge. If you're a student interested in computer science or coding, this is the challenge for you. Each year, students from all over the country participate individually or in teams to create a new app that can be used on a phone or computer. Last year, students in my district created incredible apps to address plastic pollution, education in underdeveloped countries, electronic waste, and much more. And now, I want to see what you can do. The winning apps will even be displayed at the U.S. Capitol. Join in on the Congressional App Challenge today, and maybe the app you create will change the world. Hi, everyone. My name is Veronica Escobar, and I'm the Congresswoman for Texas 16th Congressional District here in El Paso. Learning to code is such an exciting and important component of our daily lives. Learning to code means that you're helping solve problems, address big challenges, and also bring people together. I'd like to encourage you to participate in the Congressional App Challenge to learn how to code and to use code to build a better future for all of us. Hi everyone, I'm Congressman Jared Huffman. I represent the second congressional district. It goes from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border. And in addition to the honor of serving this beautiful place and all the legislative work that I do day to day, I get to be involved in innovative programs in our community like the Congressional App Challenge. And I want to start by thanking all of you for your interest in this competition. It is one of my favorite programs because it highlights brilliant young minds in my congressional district. The way this challenge works is it's an opportunity for students across the country to improve their technological skills and build a resume for the 21st century job market. It's an opportunity for them to also creatively address and solve issues in their communities, both big and small. And this year's competition, I think, is especially important because it's taking place in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, which has shown us just how critical technology is in keeping communities together. And the possibilities of how you can create and innovate through this contest are just endless. I've seen some really impressive submissions over the years, including apps that help students study for the AP chemistry exam, apps that help bring our solar system to life on your phone in proportional detail, apps that create a modern day jukebox to share music with friends or rank websites privacy settings on a scorecard that consumers can easily understand. So uh, let's get creative. Let's start building. I'm really looking forward to seeing your submissions. Thanks for participating in the Congressional App Challenge. Hi, everyone. This is Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill. I think uh, we need your skills more than ever right now as we've moved into a new age of technology. I'm excited to see what you come up with for the App Challenge. So welcome to the 2020 Congressional App Challenge and good luck. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and let's get to it. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Alex Cook from ACT. Um, ACT is an association with, which represents more than 5,000 app makers and connected device companies in the mobile economy. ACT is a longtime supporter and current sponsor of the Congressional App Challenge, uh, and their team has been kind enough to organize an expert panel of their membership to provide advice and perspective to app challengers. Uh, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Alex. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and panelists, I'm going to have you guys turn your videos on. Hello. Um, Hello. So thank you so much for having us. We are so excited to support the Congressional App Challenge and uh, to get the chance to speak with all of you today. Um, 
As uh, Joe mentioned, my name is Alex and I'm the Director of Membership at ACT, the App Association. Um, just very quickly background on us. Um, so the App Association, we're a tech trade association and that essentially means that we work with our members to educate policymakers on how legislation or potential policies will impact tech companies. Um, we connect our members with speaking and media opportunities like this panel. Um, we share information on market best practices, trends, general business growth opportunities, things like that. Um, our organization is unique in that all of our members are small companies um, and they've really all leveraged the power of technology um, and the wider app ecosystem to create businesses around things like health and education and security or custom design, um, which really brings us to why we're here today. Um, so our panelists are all app association members, but more importantly, they have all built careers around tech. Um, whether they're building tech, creating coding programs, or something within that realm. Um, tech is really central to their business, um, and so they're here to share their experiences with all of you. Um, so I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves. Um, panelists, if each of you could tell us a little bit about yourself, your company, and how you got into coding and tech. Um, and I can call you guys out to make it a little bit easier. Um, so Katie, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Miller, and I'm the program director for this amazing program called SC Codes. So I am based in South Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina. And the SC Codes is a nonprofit that is committed to providing free coding education for anyone in the state of South Carolina. And so um, it's extremely exciting, and it is um, unlike many other programs that exist currently. Um, I actually don't have a technical background. I'm um, kind of an outsider in the tech industry, but about five years ago, I saw the writing on the wall and knew that um, this industry was one that I wanted to be a part of. It's so interesting and it's ever growing. And so um, I fit in in that tech education space. And so for the last five years, I have been there helping individuals learn how to launch a technological career um, through education. And so I've seen many, many lives changed due to, you know, learning how to code. And so I'm very excited um, to, to be here. And I think that you all are awesome. And I love this challenge. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. That's awesome. Um, Kiana. Hello, everyone. I am Kiana Stewart. I'm the CEO and Principal Consultant of Global Force Tech Consulting, which is a software development and technology consulting company. I'm also the president of Global Force for Girls, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that works with young girls and women um, to teach them, um, to empower them, to teach them, educate them um, about the STEM workforce development. And um, I am also by training a software product and project manager and spent a good portion of my early stage career working in the software space um, and recently, of course, transitioned to owning and operating my own company now. So I'm also very excited to be here. Um, I started coding, if you will, um, kind of by happenstance. I was working as an implementation project manager for a startup uh, company when I first transitioned from my graduate program into software. And my clients kept breaking things, and so that was um, that was really sort of how I learned. <clears throat> excuse me, how I learned um, to code. I had to fix the things that they broke. And as a startup, we really didn't have lots of resources um, on the technical side. We kind of had to train ourselves and teach ourselves. So that's really that was my sort of initiation into the tech space. Um, and now I get to influence and educate and teach um, others about the benefits of technology, the benefits of coding and app development. I'm also um, a mentor in residence at George Washington University and an adjunct instructor. So I spend a lot of time with students like you all, um, answering questions, providing guidance, um, and then also just helping folks as they're navigating through their technical careers. So thank you all for having me. That's awesome. Um, Greg, how about you? Sure, um, thanks. I'm uh, Greg Haygood, obviously here in Atlanta. Um, I've got a, uh, a so, small development shop called Southern DNA that I co-founded uh, about four years ago now. Um, and we help small and medium businesses in Atlanta try to get more out of technology. Um, so whether it's you know, giving them a website, giving them an app, taking paper processes and making them digital and more efficient, um, that's kind of what we 
uh, focus on. Um, I got started in tech uh, in high school 30-ish years ago now um, when I broke my parents' computer, had to figure out how to fix it, got into computers from there at college. Um, my the computer lab that I worked in was doing a lot of work on this new thing called the World Wide Web. And I fell in love with it and decided that was what my career was going to be all about. Um, and I've been building apps and uh, websites ever since. That's awesome. And Chris? My name is Chris Sims. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sagayo Studios. We're located in Birmingham, Alabama. We do similar to what Greg does. We do custom software development, but we also do agile coaching and training and I'll, we'll talk a little more about that in a little bit. It's really how do you get really good and really fast at building software or, or even outside of the software space. We work in nonprofits and medical space, lots of different areas where we're seeing this approach and methodology get implemented. Started in Montgomery, Alabama. I ran a large government project. The two best days of my career were the day I got hired for that and the day I got fired from that job. Uh, getting fired from it opened up the door to starting Sagayo and haven't looked back nor regretted any of uh, that sense. It's been just a phenomenal opportunity. The really cool thing, one of the one of the many cool things about being in the tech space is just all the wonderful people you get to meet and, and around the world, literally around the world, getting to meet just amazing people and work with them and help them get good at what they do and get better. Uh, I started my tech experience. I know this is gonna be a surprise to a lot of people, but I was a little bit of a nerd growing up, just, just a little bit. I watched a movie in sometime in the third grade, so about four or five years ago. And um, yeah, that was a little bit of a joke, but no one laughed. <laughs> Didn't get any pity laughs on that one. Uh, in third grade, watched this movie, uh, Space Camp. There was a kid that learned, had a, a program, a computer and a robot, and they ended up going to space. And I fell in love with it. I begged my parents for a computer. They got me a Tandy TRS-80, a Trash-80, which the only thing you could do on was write program is, is to code. And so I learned to code started getting paid for in sixth grade and I've had a paid job either writing code or managing and coaching people every year since. Absolutely love it. It's, it's brought me from the super awkward, uncomfortable nerd that I was growing up uh, to where I am today, uh, able to go into a lot of different areas. And it's just a very empowering uh, leveling platform, being able to get in and, and seeing what it can do uh, what it means to people's lives. And I absolutely love being a part of it, being part of the App Association and a part of all of this. It's just a phenomenal honor. I'm glad to be here today. That's awesome. We are so stoked to have all of you. And um, I'm sure our audience can tell that we have a great panel. So um, I'm going to dive right in. Uh, but before I ask the first question, I do want to say, um, audience members, if you uh, have any questions, feel free to send them in the Q&A uh, chat and um, we will answer them kind of at the end. So looking forward to any questions that you guys have. Um, okay, so my first question. So our audience is here uh, because they've either created an app or are interested generally in coding or learning about sort of where they can find a future for themselves in tech. Um, and so could each of you talk a little bit about how you really built your business um, and share some things you think that the students should think about as they continue to participate in STEAM programs, push their apps to wider audiences, or are just considering, you know, their, their future in tech. Um, and really anyone who wants to start, go for it. <laughs> sure, I'll start. Um, so one of the things um, I would recommend would be to think about what problems you can solve. So these can be problems that you encounter personally in your day to day. These can be larger, you know, larger scale problems for um, the state or the world or your country. And if you can figure out a way to technologically create something that solves that problem, then you're going to really, really set yourself up for success. If you can identify a problem and work to uh, fix it through innovation and technology, um, you're going to really set yourself up for, for success. Yeah, I would Maybe add. I love that. Or yeah. go ahead, Kiana. Yeah, I would say I will. Um, I, I, you know, share those sentiments. I think the important part um, when you're involved in a technological environment is to really see yourself as a part of that process, right? So a lot of times we think of ourselves as an extension of it, but not as um, a component of it. Um, and team building, working with each other, um, sharing ideas, innovating together, all of those are, are attributes that I think 
help to enhance technology and help to enhance us as individuals um, as we're learning and, and growing and developing in, in, in technology as well. So in addition to what, to what Katie said, I would add, um, you know, just making sure that you are keeping the lines of communication open with the folks that you're in communication or partnership with, that you're working with, building strong teams, um, and then also considering other uh, personality traits and attributes that will lend itself to perhaps one day, you know, owning your own company or co-founding a company with, with, you know, with your team. So just adding that to the, to the process as well. Absolutely. That, that finding problems to solve and, and the building of teams absolutely do that. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do it and do the hard thing. The creativity and the innovation that are coming start in the schools and, and really where you are today, don't let anyone tell you that you can't go solve that problem. The ability to access and, and learn how to develop is so far beyond even where when I started where it was. So tap into that and try. And if you're not frustrated, if you're not like beating your head against the wall, then find the problems that, that make you beat your head against the wall. That's one of the cool things, you know, programming is this, this, you know, you spend hours and hours and hours fighting and struggling with the code, trying to get it to do what it wants. And then you have that moment when it comes through and it clicks and you get it and it works and you, you solve this really big, hard problem. That's what you're doing, but you should always be at that point, even where I am in my career or, or when I work with leaders that, that have, are, are far, you know, they seem like they're, they're out there and they're these people that you look up to. They're struggling with things. They might be a little bit more different and they might be different, maybe a little more difficult from where you are today, but we all start somewhere and keep doing the hard thing. Uh, and that's where you grow into that. And so find the cool hard problem and then go solve it because you can do it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's one of the things from my background, um, kind of like Chris's, is, is I didn't go out and solve my own problems. Um, I lucked into um, my first job was with a marketing agency and we were solving other people's problems. They would come to us and say, I don't know how to do X. You know, I'm trying to do this. I'm r running into problems. Um, and I thrived on solving those problems. Um, I didn't have to go find them. They just came to me. Um, you know, at first it was salespeople bringing it to our agency. Um, but then even after starting Southern DNA, just being out there to f be able to help other people solve their problems. Um, Cause that's um, sometimes even more gratifying than, um, you know, getting the code working just right is seeing the impact that you can have on somebody else's business um, and enabling them to, you know, do more with their lives. Yeah. And Greg, I want to talk about that a little bit more because it's kind of a path that I think that people who are learning about coding don't always think of, you know, sometimes they think, well, I got to just make an app. That's my app. Yep. Um, yep. But I think that we see more and more that development shops have really become kind of really important because they're also kind of leading to all of these other innovations in all of these industries that we don't even think of. Um, so could you talk a little bit about what it's like to work with clients? And then also this actually gets to one of the questions uh, that got asked, but um, I imagine it also means you have to use a lot of different kinds of like programming languages or like platforms or things like that. Can you talk a little bit about sort of how all of those things work together? Sure, it's a lot <laughs> to unpack. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I like I said, I started with agencies um, back in the day, and all an agency is is just like we're building stuff for other people. Um, so it was a marketing agency um, that um, it just got started by a group of friends, and I found them and started working with them. Um, they would go out, find the jobs, um, find the clients that needed help, um, and then um, you know, a lot of times the client knows exactly what they need help with, like oh, you know, like fix my website or like, I just want a brand new app. Sometimes it's like, we're losing money. Like we, we, we don't know what's going on. So part of the initial engagement um, uh, for any new client is tell us about your business. Tell us about the, the type of work that you do, the challenges that you're having. Um, and then we can figure out ways to fix it. Um, a lot of times clients will come to us and say they know what they need. And after talking to them for a while, no, no, you don't need that. You don't need to spend 50 grand on that and spend 10 grand over here or something like that. Um, and it's not always a, you know, we're going to solve it the first time out. It's, it's going to be an iterative process. We're going to get in there and let, let's carve out a, you know, one problem and work on that. 
um, and then we can kind of see how that performs and then build up from there. Um, a lot of you may have heard of uh, minimum viable products. That's even something um, that same process for new startups or even companies looking to start new initiatives is don't try to build the Facebook of apps from day one. Build something that enables you know for some friends to talk to each other and then start layering on to it. Um, so that's all part of that engagement of uh, that initial engagement of helping the client define what their problems are, what they have money for to to do anything with, um, what's their timeline, um, all that will weigh into it. Um, and yes, um, I'm the sole developer for Southern DNA. Um, my partner is not, so I've had to learn a lot. Um, again, I've been doing agency work for most of my career and I enjoy it. Um, and part of that, um, anybody that's worked with an agency, salespeople will go out and sell something and then like, oh, hey, boom, go learn how to code this, work with this language, work with whatever. Um, and I got lucky that I enjoyed doing that. And so I've learned a lot of different languages over the years. Um, and still to favorite? this day, what's that? You have a favorite language that you've learned? Um, JavaScript is, is a, a language. Um, it's a whole ecosystem as well. There's a lot of frameworks within it that you can use. Um, I do do a lot of JavaScript. Um, I might teach JavaScript at one of the design schools here. Um, that, that's the one that's got all the interest and all the buzz these days. Um, Cause you can do a lot on the web. You can do a lot with native apps via something like React Native. Um, there's a lot to go uh, to enable you to learn. It's just fun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, I sort of mentioned this, but when we talk about careers in tech, we do usually focus on kind of that STEM and that coding piece. Um, but are there other skills um, that you think are really necessary in a tech workforce? Um, and that's really for the whole panel. Um, Chris, I saw you shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have to go first, but um, <laughs> anyone else have anything they want to jump in? I would say- Critical thinking. Yeah, definitely <laughs> thinking. I would also say being a good listener. So a part of solving problems is really listening to your clients and, and really helping them to understand what exactly their problems really are. Um, because to Greg's point, sometimes they come to you with a problem that they have clearly in their minds identified is the real problem. And through listening to them and actively listening and engaging with them, you help them discover that that's really not their problem. But then what you also do is that you help guide them through or to a solution that would work better for them. So I think being an active listener, um, in addition to that, being a great communicator, being able to you know, take information and, and synthesize it and analyze it and then process that and present it back out you know, to your clients or to whomever you're speaking with about their technology needs, um, I would say those two are definitely skills that you know, are necessary being in, in this space and environment. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. just, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna agree, go, with, <laughs> <laughs> agree with Kiana. And it really is a lot about those soft skills or essential skills. I know that's kind of a buzzword, but it's oh so important. I've spoken with so many employers um, and you know hiring partners that they wanna see the students that come from a program like SC Codes or any other computer science or coding platform they want to see, yes, they want to see technical skills, mm -hmm. but they also want to make sure this person can work well on a team, um, can communicate well, and all of these things that they can't necessarily teach you, they can teach you the technical stuff. So if they're not, I've heard, had many of, of these employers say, if they don't know my, our specific tech stack, A-okay, but I want to make sure that they are going to work well with, um, you know, people who are from all kinds of different backgrounds who may be technical, who may be not technical. Are they gonna show up on time? Just those basic things are um, extremely important. And if you don't have those with the technical skills, it won't, it'll won't. it only get you so far. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I would add something I'm seeing a lot more, and especially since January when the world shut down, in some ways we got smaller and we were only interacting with our families, but in a lot of ways the business world became much larger in that I literally last the last month I worked with someone on every continent except Antarctica. 
Um, and when in one week, when you literally go around the world and just by opening up Zoom, there's a lot of really cool opportunities and it's, it's opening up the door for people that aren't in the big cities that are your typical tech hubs, you know, kind of smaller communities that are now able to get in and, and be actively part of the, the commerce and trade that's going on. So global awareness. So no longer is it okay to be in a small town and not understand what it's like to work with someone in China or with India and understanding the cultural differences that come in there because that's a very normal part of where the world is going to. And I think it's only going to get more. So that sensitivity and to Kiana and, and to Katie echoing the, the soft skills, you know, being able to work a part of a team and understand to be sensitive to that. No longer do we have the programmers are hidden in the basement and there are the you know, the trolls that you, you, everyone's afraid to go down to the basement. If I, that's, that's not the way it is anymore. Uh, it's very much a group communal effort. And I love, I love that aspect of it. Absolutely. Um, and so Katie, you kind of mentioned a little bit about what SE Codes does, and I would love to learn a little bit more about the kinds of skills um, that programs like SE Codes are teaching, but also maybe um, hear your thoughts on how attendees can find about find out about like similar programs that are in their communities. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first off, SE Codes, uh, we focus on, like Greg said, uh, JavaScript is our main, is like our bread and butter. But really, we focus on creating courses for what our state workforce needs. And so anything that someone comes into, uh, into SC Codes and learns, they know that it's a marketable skill to have and it's going to be in demand. Um, and we also have these amazing mentors, which kind of sets us apart from a lot of the other free online coding resources that are out there. So we have a group of mentors who are in the field working as developers who are there to help answer questions, uh, you know, via Slack or, you know, do a live office hours call or lead you through a virtual class. And so um, it's, it's very cool. We've got JavaScript. We're working on a React. Um, again, Greg mentioned that a React course is coming soon. We've got some Java, some Ruby on Rails. Um, it's all all are high in demand and all are wonderful starting out points for anyone who's trying to, to get into coding. As far as similar programs, um, unfortunately, I don't think there are many that have like that mentorship piece that we have. Um, I know, you know, Innovate Birmingham has had some similar things. As I say, Chris probably will know a little bit more about that than I. Um, However, that being said, there are so many free online resources. Code Academy, um, I mean, tr Treehouse, some are free. I mean, you just search free coding, Google it, and you will find a plethora of things. Um, and also, SC Codes, there are ways to get on there, even if you're not a South Carolina <laughs> resident. So I'll let y'all hack that and figure that out. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's a great starting point. Just see if you enjoy it. And really that's kind of um, the main thing that we do is we wanna say, hey, is this a cool fit for you? And if it is, here are your three next steps. So um, just do some research and reach out to me. I'm always happy, um, happy to help. Um, and I think you'll see a theme in the next few questions because I, um, a lot of our membership has really taken it upon themselves to also like participate in programs that are in their own backyard that encourages, whether it's kids, whether it's adults, whether it's people who are changing careers, um, encouraging them to code, finding resources for them to code. And so you mentioned uh, Innovate Birmingham. Chris, you sort of in partnership with other companies, but also Innovate Burning Birmingham, um, you host and teach classes. Um, including one on Scrum, which please tell us what Scrum is because I don't fully understand it. <laughs> um, but can you tell us a little bit more about that and sort of um, more about the partnership and how you guys uh, took your classes virtual? Originally, they were going to be in person and then, you know, all of this happened. So, yeah, and again, I love these questions, Alex. They're not small questions. So uh, a lot of meat there. Yeah, be small. Uh, and I... I, I <laughs> So I sit on the board of Innovate Birmingham, Katie. That's why I got excited. I love hearing the reach that's out there and, and, and just the amazing work that's going on in workforce development. We fully believe that one of the, the largest risks to the future of the American economy is 
is nothing other than our inability to build great tech talent. And so we have to get on this. We have to be hungry and, and desperate to go build and fill these, these roles. So programs like SD Codes and Innovate Birmingham are going a long way to do that. So I, over the last year, have had the honor to work with Jeff Sullivan with Scrum Inc. Jeff Sullivan. so Scrum is a process to develop, to work, and to manage projects that focuses on humans first, values first, and learning how to be really, really efficient and get better over time. So this process of if you're not better today than you were yesterday and tomorrow than you are today, then you're going to fall behind. But pushing yourself with focusing on that human in the center. So it's all around the process of leading people and getting work done that revolves around users and humans, which is what I love about it. So working with Jeff Sutler and was one of the creators, been able to go in and work with some of the world's largest companies and some of the largest agile transformations going on. As part of that, I became certified as a scrum trainer and as a scrum fellow, which is a huge honor. And there's not a lot of people in the world that are able to do that. So partnering, we've already been partnering with Innovate Birmingham. It gave a really great opportunity to bring that experience to the learners local. And so it started out as an experiment. We we're going to, I was going to teach my team. We have about 16, 17 people that we're going to go through the class. And I invited a few friends that turned into 40 people within two weeks. We had our first in-person class, which was completely full. And then we opened up some others and very quickly the word got out that we were doing this. And, and the cool thing about it is that there are people that have jobs that are coming out of other careers, whether it be a te bank teller or food service industry or lots of different industries or people have jobs today because of some of those first classes, which is really what this is about is helping people skill up to be great, uh, provide great value in, in the community. So Innovate Birmingham is very similar to SC Codes. It's a boot camp. it's free to participants. It focuses on the six counties in kind of the central Alabama area surrounding Birmingham. Uh, they've done phenomenal work in the code and we were able to bring in the agile training and the scrum master certification and the product owner is a dual certification course. So you got two certs for three days worth of class. Well, look, scrum training is an in-person class. Uh, very engaging, entertaining. I've got somewhere here, I've got buckets of pipe cleaners and Play-Doh and sticky notes, all sorts of just, I look like an arts and crafts teacher coming in to, to teach arts and crafts day. I wanna go do this. <laughs> then the pandemic happened and all of a sudden we couldn't go. And so we had 40 people signed up for this class. So we did our first in-person. The next one was gonna be in-person and very quickly we went from, all right, we're going to be in person to maybe hybrid to all virtual. And within less than a week, our team had to pivot and bring a very engaging class online. And that was one of those challenges where I said, do the hard thing and don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. And we had a team around what Kiana said, bringing that team together is so important. So we had a phenomenal team that went in, we got creative and worked and, and really over the time of doing that since January to today, I've taught over 400 students around the world, uh, international, like I said, then this last month, literally someone on every continent other than Antarctica, and maybe we need to teach Scrum in Antarctica, that would be cool. Yeah, penguins. I don't know how to, yeah, penguins would be great, I'd love that, that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> so that challenge of, hey, we have to go do this, or else it's gonna hurt revenue to our company. It's gonna hurt others getting good careers. It really was a challenge. That bearing in and pressing and being able to do it and be able to solve the problem. Like it's, it's amazing the amount of people now that know how to use Zoom mm -hmm. and know how to keep yourself muted and unmuted that, that when we started, didn't know. That first <laughs> two hours of the first virtual class was an absolute nightmare of trying to help. <laughs> A lot of different people get in. Yeah, Katie, it sounds familiar. <laughs> Sorry. You've probably been there. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all about pressing in and doing that challenge and, and, and rising up to it. We've got a, a class that we're going to do very soon that's actually going to be based in Minecraft. Oh, cool. It's an experiment. We don't know if, how it's going to work or what it will do, but it's, just, it's an opportunity to learn, to explore, to expand, to try something different. Uh, and that's what I love about this. Yeah, that's so awesome. Um, and Kiana, I want to talk a little bit more also about um, your nonprofit 
A, because I think it's really cool. Um, and I think it's also uh, really focusing on some of the issues around diversity in tech, which I think is important to talk about. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the nonprofit and kind of what inspired you really to take action? Yeah, so to, to sort of piggyback on, on you know, Chris's um, uh, comments there. Um, I'm also, you know, a certified Scrum Master product owner. So he was definitely speaking my language. And, you know, I think it's, these are great skills that you should be teaching um, and learning, you know, uh, because they do help with the development process and that team focus around, you know, software development and technology innovation. Um, so Global Force for Girls Incorporated um, is an organization with a mission to eradicate the barriers that exist for young women and girls in STEM workforce development. So we've been talking about, you know, workforce development, you know, educating, training, and, and empowering uh, students in, you know, learning about the different careers that exist in technology. And so as a mentor in residence and instructor um, in the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at GW, um, I have a lot of opportunity to interface with um, some really bright, amazing, smart, talented young women who, when they saw me, would say, you know, we don't see ourselves, right? We don't see ourselves reflected. We're in offices and classrooms and engaging with predominantly men. Um, and so we're just excited to have you to hear. And as I started working with them, I, I partnered with one of the entrepreneurial fellows. We brought the first um, mobile app design and management workshop to GW, which was a huge success. That's cool. Uh, yeah, and so partnering with students and engaging with them, I started thinking about the challenges that they face as young women, um, you know, black and brown women as well on college campuses, and made some assumptions about whether that was taking place at the high school level. Um, and so I pitched the pilot program to my high school. I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, so I pitched the, um, the pilot program, the pipe, uh, pathways to, um, uh, it's a diversity pipeline to pathways uh, program um, to the principal there, Cindy Harkham at Baltimore City College um, High School, which is my alma mater. And I thought that because of the pandemic, you know, they would say, this is great, this is a good idea, but you know, because of everything that's happening with the schools and the challenges and the changes, um, that they would want it sometime in the future. And she said, no, today. <laughs> and so we had to very quickly, you know, develop this curriculum, which really focuses on some of the things that we've been talking about today, right? Like, not just those hard technical skills. We definitely need those folks need to learn the different programming languages to be successful in technology. But, but what are the challenges that, that students and young women are facing uh, as they enter into the workforce, right? So we know that there are definitely diversity issues within the tech industry. Um, and so what we're doing is working with um, black and brown young women uh, and girls to really educate them, to empower them and to train them to be able to not only have those really solid technical skills, but to also develop um, a sense of, of um, belonging and understanding about how to use those skills and talents once they're actually in a, a STEM career, right? Um, and then identifying, you know, ways that we can partner with other organizations to hold them accountable. Because the other side of that is that once we place uh, diverse, you know, candidates in these environments, that, you know, they kind of just fall to the wayside, right? And so there's, uh, they experience challenges like I did working in software where they're underrepresented, underpaid. Um, they don't necessarily have the mentorship that they need to kind of help them climb that, that corporate ladder or that the technology um, ladder in their environments. And so we really wanna be working with them to help them understand what are some of the ways that they can learn to advocate for themselves um, as, as they are navigating these new careers and also of course shining in those environments because they are talented, smart, capable, and, and um, aware of the world around them and being able to partner with, again, other folks that may not look like them, but also, you know, who are interested in working with them and who want to really help them um, advance. So, so that's what the organization, um, the mission is, and I'm extremely proud of, of the work that we have been tasked to do. Um, you know, I'm taking a lot of my own personal experiences, you know, as a Scrum Master, as a product owner, um, as the CEO of a software development company, and using my skills to really help translate that into a curriculum that will be um, amazing and beneficial for the girls for their futures, so. That's so awesome. It's so exciting to hear about programs like this. Um, and 
one of the things that you said that I think is so important that everyone who uh, all of our attendees really take to heart is like mentorship actually is pretty important as you're sort of looking to like become a professional and sort of like, I think in technology, it helps even, you know, in my career, I never thought I was going to be even remotely near tech. And now I talk about tech every day. And a lot of that has to do with mentors that I had. So um, definitely like seek out people who are sort of interested in what you're interested in and just like ask them questions because you'll learn so much from those like little one-off questions that you ask. Um, I want to make sure we have time for some questions from the audience. So I'm sort of going to ask kind of the, if you knew today, uh, if you knew then what you knew today, what would you do differently? Um, you know, if you were going back in time and talking to someone just starting out in your shoes, you know, what would you tell them? What would your advice be? Um, and I'll, uh, maybe Katie, if you want to start. Sure. <laughs> um, as a non-techie, my first thing would have been to tell my younger self, learn to code. Um, I know it's not too late for me, but it would have been, um, you know, definitely something that had I known now how this industry just continues to grow and all of the opportunities, it's a skill everyone should have. It can help you regardless of really what even, you don't even have to be a software developer for these skills to be useful and marketable. Um, but the other thing would, that I would tell my younger self would just to be explore everything. So take the time to really figure out what your passion is. Um, although your passion can absolutely change. Um, <laughs> there's no way that you all as, you know, you know, teenagers to young adult have to know what you're going to do for the rest of your life. It is a okay to change it up along the way and to pivot and you'll be surprised even if you you know to end up in a um you know technical field with a non-technical background much like myself there's still so many of those skills that i learned um in other leadership roles or in my you know through obtaining my degree in psychology that i can still use in this tech industry and so figure out what drives you and never ever stop learning new things and honestly whatever makes you happy and also challenges you it's easy to find something and just be comfortable um, and stagnant um, throughout your career and it's very important that you always challenge yourself for that especially speaking to the young women in this um, because it is more like we're not taught that necessarily from a young age, but never stop striving for that next step, um, no matter what you do, and then just do it to your absolute best ability. Absolutely. Um, Greg, you next. Yeah, um, I'd say, you know, don't be afraid to take risks when you're younger. Um, I waited a long time to start out on my own. Um, doing the nine to five thing. It was agency, so nine to five for an agency is different, but still um, thought, you know, took a long time for me to get around to being comfortable with like, oh no, I, I can make a full successful career on my own. I don't need to clock in for, you know, a nine to five job anywhere. Um, and like Katie said, like try different things. I was dabbling on the side, building apps for other people and those turned into, you know, other ongoing opportunities. Um, and I wish I had done that, you know, maybe 10 years earlier than I did. Um, who knows where I'd be now, but not, not that I'm upset. I'm very happy with my uh, career so far, but uh, who knows where it might've gone if I had just been taking a little more risk earlier. Yeah. Um, Kiana, how about you? I would say something similar. So I have two things. Uh, the first is um, develop a self-care plan. I definitely would have told my younger self, you know, to, to prioritize self-care. I think when you're young, you feel invincible, you know, and you feel like you can, you know, take on the world and you can, uh, but as you start to get older, you know, you, you do need to, to be mindful of what self-care means to, to you as an individual. Um, so I would have definitely encouraged myself to create a self plan, self-care plan and to prioritize, you know, resting, relaxing, you know, taking time off and away from, from the work. Uh, which is extremely difficult now. Um, so yeah, so I would tell my, my younger self that. I would also tell my younger self uh, not to listen to folks who told me that I was too much of something, right? So I was too bossy, I was too uh, precocious, I was too aggressive, I was too ambitious. 
uh, I would definitely tell my younger self to, to, to take in that information, to again, analyze it, synthesize it, process it, but not hold on to it. Because to Greg's point, you know, I could have been the CEO of six companies by now, had I not been, um, you know, sort of, uh, encouraged, as Katie was mentioning, you know, as as a as a, a girl and as you know as a black girl, not to to be those things, right? And so some of those same attributes that folks tell you, as women, that we shouldn't you know uh, tout, are the very things that are beneficial to me um, in the role of CEO of this company, right? And so um, and and being able to interface with you all and talking with you all about the work that I'm doing, um, I am very proud to be. Uh, the boss, right? And also sometimes bossy, because that's a part of the process. Um, but really turning those sort of negative constructs that we teach young girls on their head. And how do we take that information and turn it into something that's positive? So I would definitely have encouraged my younger self to, again, to listen, because, you know, sometimes there are folks that have been through this process before you, they know a little bit more than you do, but not to hold on to that and to assign that to myself um, so that I prevented myself from being able to move forward. Um, you know, also like Greg, I um, was still working a full nine to five job when I first started my consulting company uh, because I just wasn't quite comfortable yet that I could, you know, do it, you know, full time and make a living doing it without, again, as he mentioned, clocking in um, to a nine to five. Nothing wrong with nine to fives, but I think as the world is changing and shifting and growing, we're starting to see entrepreneurship is an essential component of that process and technology is just right there with it. So um, I would encourage all of you all to, to think outside the box, to solve problems, to be creative, to communicate, develop self-care plan, um, and then also, you know, don't necessarily listen to, to the haters, right? So. Yeah, I love that. And Chris, how about you? Yeah. All right. I mean, ditto to what Kiana says for absolutely <laughs> sure. Um, keep yourself open to new experiences and be in the place where you're terrified. Because mm -hmm. in those places where we're terrified and we do it anyway, we find that courage to make it through. Even when you know you, you don't belong there, that's where we grow. And don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. And I said that a couple times, that, that when you walk into a room and you feel completely overwhelmed, and you do it anyway, that's where you grow um, and push into that and, and seek out those opportunities. If you're not doing something where you feel completely underqualified, but you do it anyway, then you're not stretching yourself to get to that next step. And no matter where you are, who you are, what your background is, that's something that, that will drive you and, and help you grow. And that's, that's really just kind of talking back to younger me. That's what I wish I could have pushed. And, and when I did make that, that, that next step kind of, kind of like you, you know, becoming bossy and then getting this place where, you know, I had to be in charge and make the decision. That's where I've grown the most, grown most of my career and been able to have the largest impact on the world around me. That's awesome. Um, so I want to turn to some of these uh, questions that we've gotten. Um, and there's a common theme among many of them, which is sort of um, the question around where do you start, whether it's in picking your programming language um, or in sort of uh, coming up with an idea. We kind of talked about this a little bit, which is sort of like trying to find a problem that no one else has solved yet or a problem that you feel really passionately that you can solve. Um, but so a lot of the questions that we're getting are a little bit around sort of how do you figure out where to start? Um, so if anyone has any thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, oh. Kiana and I always start talking. And say, <laughs> no. Go ahead, Kiana. <laughs> Go ahead. I think that it is um, undervalued about going with your gut, right? We I don't feel like we talk enough about that. I think that there are natural um, progressions there that people sort of find themselves in, and I think that um, there is a large component to investigating, to to talking to people, to having mentors having access to different types of careers and career paths to kind of get your foot in the door. But, you know, I would also sort of turn that inward and, and ask yourselves, what do you like? What excites you, right? Like what gets you really fired up and energized? And if you can find a way to, to take that and then to sort of parlay that into the technical space, I think that that for me would be a good step. It's sort of looking inward, asking yourself those critical, you know, investigative questions, what do I like? What, what excites me? You know, um, if I could do this thing for 24 hours a day, would I do it? 
And if I could get paid for it, then, you know, what I, what I feel really motivated to do that. And I think that that's, um, we don't really talk enough about that. I think we, we stay in the lane of it has to be, you know, cookie cutter and, and not every, as we all have said, not every career path is cookie cutter, right? So I would say turn inward and ask yourselves what excites you and what really gets you energized and then kind of start to look at are there career paths that kind of lend itself to that? Yeah. Um, and just to kind of go off of what Kiana said, if you are digging in and you're self-reflecting and you know that technology is the answer and, you know, you just, but you don't know where to start from a learning perspective, then, you know, of course, I'm going to plug SC codes again, but there are so many uh, things out there online that are free that you can just dabble in. So if you're not sure, um, just start, um, you know, start by learning some HTML and CSS. That's a great place, great entry level place to start. And then find out if it's for you or not. And if it is, then kind of explore, you know, what's the difference between a front end and back end development? And do I like the user interface or do I like all the servers? You know, figure all of that out and then just start researching and, and Google the heck out of it. Yeah, I just to add real quick, and then I'll let uh, Chris or Greg, if you have anything to add. But um, one of the things that I would suggest is like Google your local like small business. Um, you know, like if you're in Nevada, it's Nevada Small Business Administration or Small Business, um, you know, Council or anything like that. Because a lot of times they have resources right there that are free for folks in your state, and you may be able to be able to find something that's like right in your backyard. Um, so that would just be something I would encourage everyone on. Uh, listening to do is is even just start there and see what resources are available in your backyard let alone the world wide web <laughs> right yeah meetup.com is another good one for yeah. um organizing resources um around central topics so not even just javascript programming in general but it'll be react programming there they'll have i think there's two different meetups here in atlanta just for that um they meet in different parts of town um obviously right now they're doing them all virtual um, so you can attend way more. Um, it wasn't feasible to go to, um, you know, two in a day, but now it is. Um, you can go dabble. They're all, most of them are tend to be free. They're an hour or two in the evening or sometimes over lunch. Um, just join them and just listen to it. See, you know, does the community seem fun, like in, in your local community or abroad or farther out? Um, but that's a great way to dabble in a lot of things because those, a lot of times they'll do t deep dives on a specific topic. You can find out how do I do location tracking in a PWA that I'm building in React. Like, oh, hey, there might be a meetup topic on that. Um, and sometimes they'll have recordings of past topics too. Um, so that's a great way to um, explore. All of that, definitely finding the network of people that can encourage you, that person that can help mentor and inspire you and challenge you to do more. If you don't have that idea to go solve, and we all are in that, and sometimes we're not, maybe we're not the, let's go come up with a dream, let's go build something. And a lot of people, that's, that's where they want to do, start building. Find some software that's open source that you like, or that is a scary, daunting piece of software to go write. I'm thinking, you know, like a, you know there's, there's just tons of great enterprise level uh, software out there that's completely open source. And get into it and read and understand and learn how, leaders in like top developers solve their solve problems across the industry and you know, looking at like VS code or WordPress or MySQL or Linux or insert your your big complicated thing get in there find some code that's out there and read it and learn it and as far as languages because I know that's something that always pops up what's the best language to go learn it learn something JavaScript's a great start I'm a big fan of C sharp mm -hmm. just learn one the reality behind programming languages is once you learn one and you learn how the constructs work, the next one is easier and the next one's easier. I've lost count of how many languages I've written code that's in production because it should always change. And it, the industry is constantly learning and growing and evolving. And so one thing I've always challenged every new developer that I've ever worked with is in each project, find a new technique, find a new approach, find something new that you've never done before and do it commit yep. to that work. So if you're in a sprint planning and you're seeing work and you're going to go to your daily scrum and you say, Hey, I'm going to take this work here. Don't take the thing that you're comfortable with. Take the thing that you don't know how to go do and then go do it. And it's, it's not easy 
to start, but once you start doing that and you, and you take on those challenges and you solve them anyway, then it just gets easier and easier and easier over time. And it becomes just the way you think and, and getting that the way you think should always be changing and adapting is, is really where we need to get to be great in this community. Yeah. And I think the and, only thing I would add to this is also like, if you have no idea even where to start from a coding language perspective, um, if you have a phone, um, and you really like the way that your phone works, um, figure out like, is it an iPhone? Is it an Android phone? Something like that. And then go check out the platform, right? So Google iOS development and see what kind of services they offer. Um, because a lot of times they offer their own coding language, um, something that's like pretty simple and scalable for that platform. Um, and it kind of gives you a cool starting place, right? So you can kind of just create something initially and then figure out where you want to go from there. Um, but that would be one of my suggestions too. It's just the platforms are kind of interesting when it comes to when you're just starting out and trying to figure out whether or not you even like it. Um, and actually Alex. tying both of those together yeah. real quick, um, <laughs> github.com, um, if you're not yeah. familiar with it. That's the place where you can go and see everybody's published their open source code. There's iPhone apps out there, there's Android apps, there's React apps, you know, every kind of code that is out there. So if you wanna just go there and just start using their search, looking for features or functionality, um, there's a wealth of code there that you can learn from. Not all of it's good, but most of it tends to be good. Uh, one thing, just as a caveat, you don't have to pay for this stuff. So watch the boot camps that want you want to charge you like eighteen thousand dollars or eight thousand or whatever the number is uh, out of the gate. There's too many nonprofit, really great organizations that are doing it right. Look at those first, and don't let a college degree stop you from doing it. I don't have a college degree, and no one, if I ever apply for a job, no one's ever going to ask me for to validate those credentials anymore. I, college has its place and is great, and I'm not, and I'm not belittling the experience and it definitely could open doors for you but it's not needed we're too desperate for great developers and innovation and we need as many people out there learning and going and doing this and whether or not and even outside of development project management being a scrum master and kiana i love and i want to talk to you more about your <laughs> scrum master and product owner experience i love that that there's lots of really great things that aren't just write code yeah and so find that and do it Totally. Um, well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and I'm sorry we didn't get to get all of the questions, um, but I am happy to make myself available uh, via email um, and can connect you guys uh, with panelists and things like that. But I will, um, I will turn it back over to Joe. Um, and uh, just once again, want to thank the panelists. I think this was really great, really helpful for me. Um, and uh, thank you guys for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you guys so much. That was um, an amazing panel. Thank you guys so much for the perspective that you were able to provide. Um, and thanks to all the students too for your amazing questions. I know we couldn't get to every last question in there. Um, we will be sure to um, connect you guys on with anyone that you might be interested in, in speaking further with. Um, and hopefully this is the beginning of um, a great experience in, um, in the CS space for you. Um, so, with that, uh, we'll go ahead um, and get ready to wrap here, but I wanna thank everyone at ACT as well as our panelists, Katie, Kiana, Chris, and Greg for joining us today and putting together such a great panel. Um, for everyone who hasn't yet registered, please be sure to, to sign up for the Congressional App Challenge if you're eligible. You have until October 19th to submit your app. Um, and if you sign up now, you'll make sure that you don't miss any updates along the way. Um, otherwise, thanks so much for the great event, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day uh, and hope to see you guys at our next webinar. Have a good evening.